Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 19, and we resume our study in verse 13 today. Acts 19, verse 13, Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we pick it up, as I said, in verse 13. And then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Satan scoffs at attempts to expel his demons by the use of charms, or incantations, which is how these Jewish exorcists would attempt to do it. These people were not Christians. They didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't know Christ, and they wrongly considered that the name of Jesus could be used sort of like a lucky charm. And verse 14, And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Demons are foolish for rebelling against God, but they're not stupid. And the demon here knew that these exorcists were shooting blanks because they didn't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They were not in Christ. Therefore, they didn't have any spiritual protection from Jesus, nor did they have any authority to do anything in the name of Jesus, including driving out demons. Verse 16. And the man in whom the evil spirit dwelt leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Superhuman strength is one indication of demon possession, and that certainly was the case here. This one man beat up seven. 17. And this became known to all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And so people are beginning to understand that God and demons divide the human race into two groups, and the two groups would be Christians and non-Christians. And people understood that if they were not Christians, then they were on the wrong side. And, um, you know, what they do with that is, is a different story, but at least many people understand that that's the case. And by beating up these non-Christian exorcists, that demon did something that he never dreamed he would do. He just, he just did Jesus a huge favor. Because the failure of the imposters resulted in an increased notoriety for the real thing. In other words, it resulted in greater respect for Jesus. It resulted in greater respect for the Word of God and for Christians. 18. People could see the difference. And many who believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. So, when the power of Jesus Christ became evident to the people, many of them fell down on their knees, they repented, they confessed, and they got saved. And so we see that the Word of God is powerful enough to change people's lives completely. To get people to change from their evil ways, it can do other things. It can do what other things can't do. It can do what threats can't do. It can do what punishment can't do. Just by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 19. Many of those also who used occult arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted up the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So those who repented publicly burned their occult books and their paraphernalia. And that was a sign of true repentance because they burned 
the bridges to their sinful past. Why did they do that? Well, because they repented. And on a practical level, it would mean that it would, they would be less likely that, that they could turn back to those old ways. <clears throat> so they meant business. True repentance will result in a person burning the bridges to their sinful past. Verse 20. So the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Well, the believers at this time were dead serious about following Jesus Christ, even to the point of burning their occult books and paraphernalia, things like that. Consequently, the Word of God prevailed. Spiritual lukewarmness is something that you want to stay away from if you're a Christian. Spiritual lukewarmness holds back the effectiveness of Christians. To be most effective for Jesus, you have to be committed to holiness. These people were in the church group. This half-hearted business, following Jesus, half-hearted is not following Jesus at all. It's nothing. 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who had ministered unto him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. So, you know, you can tell there just was no coasting at all for Paul, was there? Great things happened in Ephesus, but since we only have one life to live, one life to give to our Savior, Jesus Christ, Paul sets his sights on other places as well, including the big prize, which was Rome. And Paul is just going to keep on working until God says stop. 23, and the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Well, the word of God was changing people. It was proclaimed clearly. It was proclaimed without compromise. People were getting saved. People were living for Jesus. That means more people were getting saved and more people were serious about living the Word of God. It was changing people. And because it was changing people, they stopped buying their idols. And consequently, the silver craftsmen were not making any money. This was a money-making deal for them. People who are walking with Jesus do not spend their money in an ungodly way. They give their money to a good Bible-believing ministry, a Bible-teaching ministry, to a good church that teaches the Bible. That's where they put their money. They don't squander it on garbage. 25. These he called together with the workmen of, an, of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Verse 26. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away many people, saying that there are no gods which are made with hands. And I guess these people actually believe that, you know, there was a God, so-called, living in their little statues. They believed it, and they just couldn't figure out how Paul could preach something contrary to that, something so obvious to them, so obviously warped. 27. So that not only this our craft is in danger of being set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnific magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. And I got news for you, and I wish I could tell them this. If the majesty of a goddess can be destroyed by man, then she is no goddess. She is nothing. If her existence depends on the accolades of people, she is no goddess. And I can, I can draw a clear contrast for you. The real God doesn't need anyone. Jesus doesn't need anyone. The entire world could reject him, and he would be just as real, just as powerful, and just as wonderful as he has ever been. The real God isn't diminished when people neglect him. People who neglect him are diminished. 
You got to come to the defense of your goddess? Or she'll go out of existence, basically? 28. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, the silversmith wasn't just a craftsman. We can see that here. He was also a pretty good demagogue. Boy, he knew what buttons to push to get people fired up, and he pushed them. 29. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, who were Paul's companions in his travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples would not let him. And Paul would have marched right in there and tried to rescue his friends, because that's the kind of guy he was. It says, though, in verse 31, And certain of the Asian chiefs, who were his friends, sent unto him, urging that he would not venture into the theater. So Paul had friends that kept him from doing something really foolish. Or he certainly would have done it. And he would have justified it, too. You know, it just goes to show that Christians need to help each other think clearly. Not emotionally. Especially during stressful times. 32, some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the greater part knew not for what purpose they had come together. They were just insane, that's what they were. Most of the people didn't even know why they were protesting. They had no idea, they had just been fired up. And often that's the way it is in situations like that. You get a couple of demagogues who, who have a reason to stir up a protest, some political passion of theirs and, and they get people fired up and half the people don't even know why they're protesting. They just go along with the crowd. <clears throat> 33. It says, And they drew Alexander out from the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they perceived that he was a Jew, all with one voice, for about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. This thing is about to explode into a full-scale riot. And the Jews don't want to be blamed, of course, for a riot, so they conscript Alexander to make a speech to clear them of any blame. But the mob is so crazy that they don't even give him a chance to speak. As soon as they recognize him as a Jew, they just go berserk and start screaming about, their goddess, 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there who knoweth not that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Well, it does uh, point out a belief of the people here that the uh, man here speaking is trying to remind the people of. The people in that area believe that the statue of Diana, which stood in her temple, had fallen from the sky, had been sent by the god Jupiter. Okay, that's what they believe. And this public leader is telling the mom that Diana is not an idol made by hands, which Paul says are no gods at all. She doesn't fall into that category. She hasn't been made by hands. So listen, people, Diana isn't like the other idols. We know that her image fell from heaven. Well, verse 36. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, I mean, there's no argument against this. This is a slam dunk, he says. Boy, talk about being deceived, huh? So, it's a seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against. You ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. In other words, you people are making too much out of this. I'll go along with that. 37. For ye have brought hither these men who are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. And I suppose technically that's true uh, because Paul was preaching that there was one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that idols were nothing. He certainly did say that, but he never spoke specifically about the so-called goddess Dinah. Verse 38. Therefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies, let them charge one another. 
In other words, if the silversmiths want to bring charges against the apostles, they're going to have to do it legally in court. Because this isn't, this isn't going to work. 39. But if ye inquire of anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. In other words, vigilantism is not going to be tolerated. If they want to press charges against the apostles, they're going to have to do it in a lawful assembly before the judge. And that's a pretty biblical notion coming from a bunch of heathens. And I say it's a biblical notion because God is the one who spoke against anarchy and people taking the law into their own hands, and he forbid that. Verse 40, For we are in danger of being called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we can give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. So the civil government did its job here, which is what God designed it to do. Civil government is actually a gift from God to restrain anarchy. And even bad civil government is better than no government. It restrains evil. It keeps sinful man from getting out of control. Now let's go into chapter 20. And after the uproar had ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone through those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he abode about three months. And when the Jews lay wait for him, he was about to sail for Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. So more of the same. Another ambush planned against Paul, so he changed his plan. When he heard about it, he adjusted. And that's good because God gives us common sense. And it is biblical to use common sense. It's not unspiritual, as some might tell you. Four, and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and from Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These men going ahead tarried for us at Troas. And actually, the seven men listed here who traveled with Paul were representatives of their own individual churches, and they were bringing offerings to the struggling church in Jerusalem. Verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and joined them five days later at Troas where we stayed seven days. It, it, took, it took five days to travel 150 miles back in those days from Philippi to Troas. Five days, 150 miles, and that's something. Today, take 20 minutes by plane. Maybe two days, two and a half days, I suppose. Um, or two and a half hours, I should say, by car, instantly by TV, by radio, by internet. So we Christians today in the 21st century have been given much. What great opportunities we have to get out the Word of God instantly all around the world, into people's homes, into people's vehicles. What an opportunity we have. And, you know, it's like the Bible says, though, to whom much is given, much is expected. So we will be accountable for the opportunities that we have to give out the Word of God or to help get out the Word of God. Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. first day of the week actually began sunset on Saturday night. And so this was a Saturday evening service. 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, having fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long in preaching, he sank down with sleep and fell down from the third floor and was taken up dead. And so this guy, the young man, is, is sitting in the windowsill. He's listening to Paul preach. He's getting the fresh air, but it wasn't enough to keep him awake. He falls asleep, and he falls right out of that window, three stories on the ground, dead. 10. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. You just witnessed a miracle. God raised him from the dead. 11. When he therefore had come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked for a long while, even until daybreak, he departed. 
and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. So what, a, what an amazing service this was. Paul preaches until, until dawn. And you talk about, talk about an exciting service. A young man died. A young man was raised from the dead. And these people received the word of God and they sat and they listened to it all night. What a, what a wonderful thing to have that kind of a hunger for the word of God. 13, and we went ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, there intending to take aboard Paul. For so had he arranged, intending himself to go on foot. And, and that would be Paul. He, instead of sailing to Asos, along with the other fellows, Luke and the others, Paul decided he was going to walk. And I imagine he just didn't want to miss an opportunity to witness to somebody on the streets. doesn't matter how you get out the Word of God. As long as you get out the Word of God, and if you're not called to preach, you're not called to teach, then help someone who is get out the Word of God, but make sure they're really doing it. Every Christian, though, is called to proclaim the Word of God in one way or another. Verse 14. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and arrived the next day off Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tragilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to set sail past Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he was in haste that it might be possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And for Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem for the Passover. And he knew that stopping at Ephesus would just put a real quick end to that. And it'd take too long to say goodbye to all his friends in that place. So he had to make the choice, and he just skipped it. Sometimes we can't have everything that we want, even when what we want is good. Verse 18. It says, When they had come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, in what manner I have been with you in all seasons, serving the Lord in all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me through the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable for you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Notice what verse 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul was a servant of Jesus, not of himself, not even of the people, but of Jesus. And consequently, he didn't withhold truth. And it didn't matter if he was uncomfortable with it or his listeners were. Why? Because he was a servant of Jesus. And Jesus wanted him to get out the whole counsel of God, just as he wants me and others to do the same thing today. 22. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I go into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He didn't know what he was running into in Jerusalem, beyond the fact that it would be a spiritual buzzsaw. He'd be, he'd be persecuted. You, you know that for a fact. But he went anyway, right? And that didn't stop him. 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I life, my life, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's life was irrelevant to himself. Now think about that. That's what he is saying here. As far as he was concerned, his life was irrelevant. He wasn't worried about himself. And if that sounds extreme, and I bet it does to a lot of people, a lot of people even call themselves Christians, boy, they would be in shock. Because I've heard the gasps in audiences when I've said certain things like this. Paul's life's, life was irrelevant to him. Your life should be irrelevant to you. People would gasp in horror. That just goes to show how far we have fallen from a biblical idea of what a Christian should be. How lukewarm many have become. 25. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. 
He knew this would be the last time, and that's a sad thing, that he would ever see them in this life. That's a sad situation whenever it happens. Therefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shrunk from declaring unto you all the counsel of God. He said, if anybody goes to hell that I've been around, it's not my fault because I've talked to them about Jesus and I've told them the truth about the entirety of the Word of God. Don't blame me. 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. In other words, give them the Word of God. Christians need the Word of God. They need to be fed the Word of God verse by verse from Genesis to Revelation. Why? Well, look at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, and not sparing the, the flock, and from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that's the importance of the Word of God. Too many people are moved by feelings. Too many Christians are moved by feelings and they have not been taught the Word of God. They've been given what feels good because that's what they want. It's, it amounts to spiritual candy and then, and then frauds come in, false teachers come in and they're led astray. Why? Because the preacher didn't have the guts to give them the Word of God in its entirety. Paul says, do it. God says, do it. That's what I've been doing here in Scripture verse by verse for 30 years. It's important. Verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that for a space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. In other words, just follow my example. Follow my example. You know, I think, uh, I think we'll stop right here. And we'll pick it up in verse 28 next time. That's what we'll do. If you want to be a part of this ministry, that would be wonderful. You can be. If this ministry has blessed you, if the Word of God through Scripture verse by verse has been a blessing to you, I just ask that you would prayerfully consider blessing us back. And our address is Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 2211. Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture, verse by verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, 54402-2211. Your partnership in this ministry would be greatly appreciated. And don't forget to check out the Scripture, verse by verse website. And I say that because everything you need to grow spiritually and to become a mature Christian and to draw closer to Jesus can be found at that website, the Bible, verse by verse.com. That, that address again, the Bible, verse by verse.com. You can study every book of the Bible, verse by verse, Genesis through Revelation, using my audio Bible commentaries, using some written commentaries. It's all there for you to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. So please, again, I ask you to prayerfully consider being a part of this ministry. If the Word of God blesses you. Again, that web address is the Bible verse by verse .com. Our, our address, Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, Wisconsin 54402 2211. Thanks for spending this time with me. See you next time.